Chapter One, Part Four of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anabasis by Xenophon, translated by H. G. Dakins, Book One, Part Four. Number Eight. It was already about full market time, and the halting place at which the army was to take up quarters was nearly reached when Patagaeus, a Persian, a trusty member of Cyrus's personal staff, came galloping up at full speed on his horse, which was bathed in sweat, and to everyone he met he shouted in Greek and Persian, as fast as he could ejaculate the words, The king is advancing with a large army ready for battle. Then ensued a scene of wild confusion. The Hellenes and all alike were expecting to be attacked on the instant, and before they could form their lines. Cyrus sprang from his carriage and donned his corslet, and then, leaping on his charger's back with the javelins firmly clutched, he passed the order to the rest, to arm themselves and fall into their several ranks. The orders were carried out with alacrity. The ranks shaped themselves. Clearchus held the right wing, resting on the Euphrates. Prozenus was next, and after him the rest, while Menon, with his troops, held the Hellenic left. Of the Asiatics, a body of Paphlagonian cavalry, one thousand strong, were posted beside Clearchus on the right, and with them stood the Hellenic Peltests. On the left was Arius, Cyrus's second in command, and the rest of the barbarian host. Cyrus, with his bodyguard of cavalry, about six hundred strong, all armed with corslets like Cyrus, and cuirasses and helmets. But not so Cyrus. He went into battle with head unhelmeted. So, too, all the horses with Cyrus wore forehead pieces and breastplates, and the troopers carried short Hellenic swords. It was now midday, and the enemy was not yet in sight, but with the approach of afternoon was seen dust like a white cloud, and after a considerable interval a black pall, as it were, spread far and high above the plain. As they came nearer, very soon was seen here and there a glint of bronze and spear points, and the ranks could plainly be distinguished. On the left were troopers wearing white cuirasses. That is Tissaphanes in command, they said, and next to these a body of men bearing wicker shields, and next again heavy-armed infantry with long wooden shields reaching to the feet. These were the Egyptians, they said, and then other cavalry, other bowmen. All were in national divisions, each nation marching in densely crowded squares. All along their front was a line of chariots at considerable intervals from one another the famous scythe chariots, as they were named, having their scythes fitted to the axle-trees and stretching out slantwise, while others protruded under the chariot seats, facing the ground, so as to cut through all they encountered. The design was to let them dash full speed into the ranks of the Hellenes and cut them through. Curiously enough, the anticipation of Cyrus, when at the council of war he admonished the Hellenes not to mind the shouting of the Asiatics, was not justified. Instead of shouting, they came on in deep silence, softly and slowly, with even tread. At this instant, Cyrus, riding past in person, accompanied by Pigris, his interpreter, and three or four others, called aloud to Clearchus to advance against the enemy's center, for there the king was to be found. And if we strike home at this point, he added, our work is finished. Clearchus, though he could see the compact body at the center, and had been told by Cyrus that the king lay outside the Hellenic left, for, owing to numerical superiority, the king, while holding his own center, could well overlap Cyrus's extreme left, still hesitated to draw off his right wing from the river, for fear of being turned on both flanks, and he simply replied, assuring Cyrus that he would take care, all went well. At this time the barbarian army was evenly advancing, and the Hellenic division was still riveted at the spot, completing its formation as the various contingents came up. Cyrus, riding past at some distance from the lines, glancing his eye first in one direction and then in the other, so as to take a complete survey of friends and foes. When Xenophon, the Athenian, seeing him, rode up from the Hellenic quarter to meet him, asking him whether he had any orders to give. Cyrus, pulling up his horse, begged him to make the announcement generally known that the omens from the victims internal and external alike were good. 
While he was speaking, he heard a confused murmur through the ranks and asked what it meant. The other replied that it was the watchword being passed down for the second time. Cyrus wondered who had given the order, and asked what the watchword was. On being told it was, Zeus, our savior, and victory, he replied, I accept it, so let it be, and with this remark rode away to his own position. And now the two battle lines were no more than three or four furlongs apart, when the Hellenes began chanting the paean, and at the same time advanced towards the enemy. But with the forward movement a certain portion of the line curved onwards in advance, with wave-like sinuosity, and the portion left behind quickened to a run, and simultaneously a thrilling cry burst from all lips, like that in honor of the war-god, Eleo! Eleo! And then the running became general. Some say they clashed their shields and spears, thereby causing terror to the horses, and before they had got within arrow-shot, the barbarians swerved and took to flight. And now the Hellenes gave chase with might and main, checked only by shouts to one another not to race, but to keep their ranks. The enemy's chariots, reft of their charioteers, swept onwards, some through the enemy themselves, others passed the Hellenes. They, as they saw them coming, opened a gap and let them pass. One fellow, like some dumbfoundered mortal on a race-course, was caught by the heels, but even he, they said, received no hurt, nor indeed, with the single exception of someone on the left wing, who was said to have been wounded by an arrow, did any Hellion in this battle suffer a single hurt. Cyrus, seeing the Hellenes conquering, as far as they went at any rate were concerned, and in hot pursuit, was well content. But in spite of his joy, and the salutations offered him at that moment by those about him, as though he were already king, he was not led away to join in the pursuit, but keeping his squadron of six hundred horsemen in close order, waited and watched to see what the king himself would do. The king, he knew, held the center of the Persian army. Indeed, it is the fashion for the Asiatic monarch to occupy that position during action for this twofold reason. He holds the safest place, with his troops on either side of him, while, if he has occasion to dispatch any necessary rider along the lines, his troops will receive the message in half the time. Accordingly, the king on this occasion held the center of his army, but for all that he was outside Cyrus's left wing, and seeing that no one offered him battle in front, nor yet that the troops in front of him, he wheeled as if to encircle the enemy. It was then that Cyprus, in apprehension lest the king might get round to the rear, and cut to pieces the Hellenic body, charged to meet him. Attacking with his six hundred, he mastered the line of troops in front of the king, and put to flight the six thousand, cutting, as it is said, with his own hand their general, Artagerses. But as soon as the rout commenced, Cyrus's own six hundred themselves, in the ardor of pursuit, were scattered, with the exception of a handful who were left with Cyrus himself, chiefly his table companions, so called. Left alone with these, he caught sight of the king, and the close throng about him. Unable longer to contain himself, with a cry, I see the man! He rushed at him, and dealt a blow at his chest, wounding him through the corslet. This, according to the statement, of Tesius, the surgeon, who further states that he himself healed the wound. As Cyrus delivered the blow, someone struck him with a javelin under the eye severely, and in the struggle which then ensued between the king and Cyrus, and those about to protect one or the other, we have the statement of Tesius as to the number slain on the king's side, for he was by his side. On the other, Cyrus himself fell, and eight of his bravest companions lay at the top of him, the story says that Artipus, the trustiest among his wand-wearers, when he saw that Cyrus had fallen to the ground, leapt from his horse and threw his arms about him. The king bade one slay him as a worthy victim to his brother. Others say that Artipates drew his scimitar and slew himself by his own hand. A golden scimitar, it is true, he had. He also wore a collar and bracelets and the other ornaments, such as the noblest Persians wear for his kindness and fidelity had won him honors at the hands of Cyrus. Number 9. So died Cyrus, a man, the kingliest and most worthy to rule of all the Persians who have lived since the elder Cyrus, according to the concurrent testimony of all who are reputed to have known him intimately. 
to begin from the beginning when still a boy and whilst being brought up with his brother and the other lads his unrivalled excellence was recognized for the sons of the noblest persians it must be known are brought up one and all as the king's portals here lessons of sobriety and self-control may largely be laid to heart while there is nothing base or ugly for eye or ear to feed upon there is the daily spectacle ever before the boys of some receiving honor from the king and again of others receiving dishonor and the tale of all this is in their ears so that from the earliest boyhood they learn how to rule and be ruled in this courtly training cyrus earned a double reputation for he was held to be a paragon of modesty among his fellows rendering an obedience to his elders which exceeded that of many of his own inferiors and next he bore away the palm for skill and horsemanship and for the love of the animal himself. Nor less in matters of war, in the use of the bow and the javelin, was held by men in general to be at once the aptest of learners and the most eager practiser. As soon as his age permitted, the same preeminence showed itself in his fondness for the chase, not without a certain appetite for perilous adventure in facing the wild beasts themselves. Once a bear made a furious rush at him, and without wincing he grappled with her, and was pulled from his horse, receiving wounds, the scars of which were visible through his life. But in the end he slew the creature, nor did he forget him who first came to his aid, but made him enviable in the eyes of many. After he had been sent down by his father to be satrap of Lydia, and great Phrygia, and Cappadocia, and had been appointed general of those forces, whose business it is to muster in the plain of Castellus, nothing was more noticeable in his conduct than the importance which he attached to the faithful fulfillment of every treaty or compact or undertaking entered into with others he would tell no lies to any one thus doubtless it was he won the confidence alike of individuals and of the communities entrusted to his care or in case of hostility a treaty made with cyrus was a guarantee sufficient to the combatant that he would suffer nothing contrary to its terms Therefore, in the war with Tissaphernes, all of the states of their own accord chose Cyrus in lieu of Tissaphernes, except only the men of Miletus, and these were only alienated through fear of him, because he refused to abandon their exiled citizens, and his deeds and words bore emphatic witness to his principle. Even if they were weakened in number or in fortune, he would never abandon those who had once become his friends." He made no secret of his endeavor to outdo his friends and foes alike in reciprocity of conduct. The prayer has been attributed to him, God grant that I may live long enough to recompense my friends and requite my foes with a strong arm. However this may be, no one, at least in our days, ever drew together so ardent a following of friends, eager to lay at his feet their money, their cities, their own lives and persons, nor is it to be inferred that from this that he suffered the malefactor and wrongdoer to laugh him to scorn on the contrary these he punished most unflinchingly it was no rare sight to see on the well-trodden highways men who had forfeited hand or foot or eye the result being that throughout the satrapy of cyrus any one hellene or barbarian provided he were innocent might fearlessly travel wherever he pleased and take with him whatever he felt disposed. However, as all allowed, it was for the brave in war that he reserved a special honor. To take the first instance to hand, he had a war with the Pisidians and Mycians. Being himself at the head of an expedition into those territories, he could observe those who voluntarily encountered risks. These he made rulers of the territory which he subjected, and afterwards honored them with other gifts. So that, if the good and brave were set on a pinnacle of fortune, cowards were recognized as their natural slaves, and so it befell that Cyrus never had lack of volunteers in any service or danger, whenever it was expected that his eye would be upon them. So again, wherever he might discover any one ready to distinguish himself in the service of uprightness, his delight was to make this man richer than those who seek for gain by unfair means. On the same principle, his own administration was in all respects uprightly conducted, and in particular he secured the services of an army worthy of the name. 
generals and subalterns alike, came to him from across the seas, not merely to make money, but because they saw that loyalty to Cyrus was a more profitable investment than so many pounds a month. Let any man whatsoever render him willing service, such enthusiasm was sure to win its reward. And so Cyrus could always command the service of the best assistance, it was said, whatever the work might be. Or if he saw any skillful and just steward who furnished well the country over which he ruled and created revenues, so far from robbing him at any time, to whom he had, he delighted to give more. So that toil was a pleasure, and gains were amassed with confidence, and least of all from Cyrus would a man conceal the amount of his possessions, seeing that he showed no jealousy of wealth openly avowed. But his endeavor was rather to turn to account the riches of those who kept them secret. Towards the friends he had made, whose kindliness he knew, or whose fitness his fellow workers with himself, in aught which he might wish to carry out, he had tested. He showed himself in turn an adept in the arts of courtesy. Just in proportion as he felt the need of this friend or that to help him, so he tried to help each of them in return, in whatever seemed to be their heart's desire. Many were the gifts bestowed on him, for many and diverse reasons. No one man, perhaps, ever received more. No one, certainly, was ever more ready to bestow them upon others, with an eye ever to the taste of each, so as to gratify what he saw to be the individual requirement. Many of these presents were sent to him as personal adornments of the body or for battle, and as touching these he would say, How am I to deck myself out in all these? To my mind a man's chief ornament is the adornment of nobly adorned friends. Indeed, that he should triumph over his friends in the great matters of well-doing is not surprising, seeing that he was much more powerful than they, but he should not go beyond them in minute attentions, and in an eager desire to give pleasure, seems to me, I must confess, more admirable. Frequently, when he had tasted some specially excellent wine, he would send the half-remaining flagon to some friend with a message to say, Cyrus says, this is the best wine he has tasted for a long time. This is his excuse for sending it to you. He hopes that you will drink it up today with a choice party of friends. Or, perhaps, he would send the remainder of a dish of geese, half loaves of bread, and so forth, the bearer being instructed to say, This is Cyrus's favorite dish. He hopes you will taste it yourself. Or, perhaps, there was a great dearth of provender, when, through the number of his servants and his own careful forethought, he was enabled to get supplies for himself, at such times he would send to his friends in different parts, bidding them feed their horses on his hay, since it would not do for horses that carried his friends to go starving. Then, on any long march or expedition, where the crowd of lookers-on would be large, he would call to his friends to him, and entertain them with serious talk, so much as to say, These I delight to honor so that, for myself and all that I can hear, I should be disposed to say that no one, Greek or barbarian, was ever so beloved. In proof of this, I may cite the fact that, though Cyrus was the king's vassal and slave, no one ever forsook him to join his master, if I may accept the attempt of Orontes, which was abortive. That man, indeed, had to learn that Cyrus was closer to the heart of him on whose fidelity he relied than he himself was. On the other hand, many a man revolted from the king to Cyrus, after they went to war with one another. Nor were these nobodies, but rather persons high in the king's affection. Yet, for all that, they believed that their virtues would obtain a reward more adequate from Cyrus than from the king. Another great proof at once of his own worth and of his capacity, rightly, to discern all loyal, loving, and firm friendship is afforded by an incident which belongs to the last moment of his life. He was slain, but fighting for his life beside him fell every one of his faithful bodyguard of friends and table companions, with the sole exception of Arius, who was in command of the cavalry on the left, and he no sooner perceived the fall of Cyrus than he betook himself to flight, with the whole body of his troops under his lead. End of Book One, Part Four